Hello, welcome to Free Bible Commentary with Pastor Teacher Dr. Bob Utley. Be sure to visit Free Bible Commentary at www.freebiblecommentary.org. Now, here's Bob. You know, there is nothing more exciting in my life than the study of the Bible. That's a gift from God. People say, what do you do for a hobby? I study the Bible. They go, you've got to be kidding. No, and I'm thrilled to death about it. This just lights me up. I just can't tell you. My, ba- my great fear is that I can't share with you the excitement I had studying this. That's my great fear. And I hope I can just infect you with that. I don't want to infect you with me. I want to infect you with the book. The book is wonderful. The book will stand with you when everybody in the world leaves you. And the book is a light in a dark night. This book is God's open love letter to you and I. And the more we know it, the more we know He loves us. Well, uh, I'm going to uh, start a series of sermons out of the practical section of the book of Romans. I think we talk about theology, and I certainly love that, to put it together in all of its wonderful intricacies of but I want to talk now about how the, uh, or where the rubber meets the road of this wonderful truth. What does this do for me? And there, there are going to be several chapters through here we're going to be looking at. I don't know how fast I'm going to go through it. Uh, matter of fact, this morning I'm only going to do two verses. Don't you dare say amen. And I think these two verses are the introduction to the whole practical section. I think anybody who reads Paul's letters knows that quite often he, these are called occasional letters, which means something precipitated the writing, a problem, a need, a quarrel, or something. Of all of Paul's letters that outline like this, Romans is probably the most neutral, and by that I mean it's not unduly affected by the local situation that caused it to be written. Now, we think the reason it was written is that Paul wanted to travel to Rome, capital of the Roman Empire. He wanted to visit the Christians there. We don't know how the church got started, but Paul didn't start it. Peter didn't start it. Probably uh, Jews who were converted on Pentecost went back home. And Paul wanted to write them and tell them he wanted to come and he wanted to explain his understanding of the good news. But my goodness, when you look at the end of the book of Romans, he said, say hello to so-and-so and so-and-so and so and He knew so many people there. And so he lays out this presentation of the gospel. And I want to say to you, if there's one book of the Bible that if you spend time to know, it would help you understand all the rest, I want to say, for me in my life, the main pole of my understanding of who is Jesus and what this whole thing about is the book of Romans. And I just commend it to you with with great enthusiasm that this is the heart of what we call the Pauline understanding of who is Jesus and what he's done. I think there probably is a little, a little hair pull in this local church, and this, this hair pull probably has to do with the arrogance of Jewish Christians uh, intimidating brand new Gentile pagan Christians. And so it's not by accident that Paul lays out all this wonderful truth in 1 through 8, and then in 9 through 11 deals with what about unbelieving Israel. Well, as long as I can say that it's two different sections of this book, but they're intricately bound together. I mean, they're just, we, we divide them up because of, of the way Paul presents it, but in his mind, there is no difference. And I, and I want to say to you, I think one of the problems with the American church is that somehow we do think that if I know the gospel, that's what really counts. Know, my friend, knowing the gospel without living the gospel is an abomination to God and everybody who you know. That's the tragedy of being able to pass a theology test but not loving one another and living in accordance with what we know. So Paul comes down after all of this uh, wonderful theology and he's going to now put an introductory capstone and then tell us what this means in our daily lives. So if you will, let's look at the first two verses of Romans chapter 12. Now I think it's really interesting that it starts out, now I'm going to use two translations because neither one of them do really justice. Uh, 
I have my Williams and my New American Standard. So if you have two Bibles, you ought to bring it. Everybody thinks you're so spiritual if you carry two Bibles. And, uh, <laughs> but now my New American says, I urge you. My Williams translation says, I beg you. Now this word is really an important word. You say, well, how can, it, how can the word I beg you or I urge you be important? It's important because of what it communicated to these people. Paul is an apostle of Jesus Christ. He says that over and over again in these books. And what that means is, I have the authority from Christ to tell you what you ought to do. I mean, I am in charge. And yet he never comes across like that. Usually he does in Galatians, but most of the time he doesn't. He'll come across and say, this word is somehow in between I authoritatively command you and I tenderly beseech you. This is a tender, tough term. <laughs> Don't you like that? Well, think about it. Um, what it is, is it's Paul saying, I, I, I'm urging you, I'm beseeching you, I'm imploring you, at the same time telling them, this is not an option. I want you to participate in this. I'm, I'm excited that you're going to join with me, that your hearts are, are with mine. But when all said and done, this is what God wants you to do in Jesus Christ, exclamation point. And this word has both of those. I beseech you, I urge you, I beg you, I think is not too strong if we don't get too much of the beg in there. Now, although my translation starts with I beg or I beseech, that's not the, that's not the way this thing really starts. It really starts with the word therefore. And you say, well, is there anything significant about therefore? You bet your bippy there is. This is a logical link. What he's saying is, everything I have said before now comes down. Draw a line, add it up. What does it mean to me? He's about to do that. There are significantly three therefores in this book. And I think it's going to tell us what these mercies of God are that he's about to tell us. One is the therefore of Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Now, if you know Romans... 318 through the end of 4 says justification by faith, that we're right with God based exclusively on the finished work of Jesus Christ and whosoever will. Wow, what a neat truth that is. So at, ver at chapter 5, he summarizes, therefore, okay, now that we're all right with Christ because of his finished work and whosoever will may come, Jew, pagan, whoever wants can come. What do I do with this now? Chapters 5, 6, and 7 deal with what about the Christian and their relationship to life, their relationship to the law, their relationship to sin. Now that we're saved by Christ, what do we do with this sin problem that all of us continue to struggle with? Well, that's what 5, 6, and 7 is all about. Now, he sums that all up. Chapter 8, verse 1, the second therefore appears based on Christ's finished work, and we would call that justification, based on the Christian struggle with sin and the law, we would call that sanctification, then Paul hits this marvelous high peak of theology that we know as Romans chapter 8, where he says we do not walk in the flesh, but we walk after the Spirit. And just, oh, it just lays out beautiful, beautiful truths about who we are in Christ. Now, Right after 8 goes this 9 through 11, which is what about unbelieving Israel? Israel had all the benefits. Israel had all the prophets. Israel had the Messiah. Israel had everything. Why did the Jews reject? Now, I think Paul stuck this in there because the Jews were being pretty obnoxious in Rome, Jewish Christians. And he puts this in there to kind of uh, say to you, you need to back off. You, you, you were chosen, but you weren't chosen because you're so hot. You were chosen because of God's love. Now, the third, therefore, after we have talked about this ideal of unbelieving Israel and all of its relationship, what does that mean? And by the way, I think this whole passage is characterized by the word mercy. I don't think it's characterized by predestination. That's chapter 9. But this whole section about Jews who don't do what they're supposed to do, if you'll look at chapter 11, verses 30 through 32, you'll see the use of the word mercy used twice which introduces us right into chapter 12. Why do I live the Christian life? To get brownie points with God? To earn my way to a bigger house? 
to make God think I'm really something, to, to, to really do something that God will be impressed? No, no, croak, no. Everything we do for God, we do out of the overflow of gratitude based on the undeserved merits that Christ came and died for us. We do nothing to win favor with God because the truth is we're all still pretty messed up. So chapter 12 is going to come and, and kind of tell us now what are we going to do in light of all that God's done for us, in light of justification, in light of sanctification, in light of unbelieving Israel? How do we come to this? Well, that's where it comes to. I urge you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, notice it's plural. Some would say this is the plural of majesty going back to the Old Testament. I don't think that at all. I think it's plural because there's more than one mercy. And the mercies have been spelled out for us in Romans in clear doctrinal, not light bulbs, but searchlights. Oh my, what a book this is. Because of the mercies of God, because of all that God has done for us in Jesus Christ, all that He is doing for us in the Holy Spirit, all that He is going to do for us in eternity, based on all of that, now He's going to ask us to live. Now, uh, in theology, we have... Uh, it's becoming uh, rather common to use a phrase to describe this flow. We talk about uh, just a statement of truth, and we call it in grammar and indicative. And that, the statement of truth is, God loves you, Jesus died for you, whosoever will may come. We do have the indwelling spirit to overcome sin and the law and death. And that's, that's, those are statements. You don't, that's not anything you can mess with. That's finished. That's in history. That's from God. But based on statements like that, then God calls on us with imperatives, commands. And we call this the indicative and the imperative. Because of who I am in Christ, now I need to live a certain way. I usually put it a little different way, but it's helpful for me. I have won the race in Jesus Christ. The trophy is on the shelf. My name is written on it. I mean, it's, it's, it's over, it's done. God's my Father. Jesus is my brother, friend, Savior, and Lord. He's coming back to get me on the eastern skies someday. That's finished, that's done. Put it on the shelf. Your name's in the book of life. That's that. But because of that, then God says to me, Now, Bob, I want you to run the race for me. Not to get that, not to earn that, but because of who I am, because of what I've done for you, and you know I want to do it to every child of Adam. I want you to run for me, Bob, so when they see your good works, they'll glorify your Father who's in heaven. So when they see how changed your life is, how different you are, they'll come to me. Bob, I want you to be the light to the world, the salt of the earth. Bob, run for me. Bob, live! And Baptists are scared to death about works, so we have just taken it out of the deal and put once saved, always saved in there that emphasizes the trophy on the shelf and ignores the life to be lived. Turn salvation into a point instead of into a process. Now, this is the process. By the mercies of God to present. Now, there is a ton of of sacrificial words in here. Present is often used to present a sacrifice. The word holy is a word that's from the sacrificial system. The word sacrifice is here. The word acceptable is an Old Testament word for an acceptable sacrifice. We are in a sacrificial setting. He is using priestly terms to describe what he wants me to do. Bob, because of the mercies of God, I urge you, I beg you, I command you, Bob, to present, and this is the word, if you picture in my mind, a priest taking a dead animal and placing it on the altar. It's an aorist tense, which means kind of a completed act. It's a once and for all dedication. You only put that dead animal one time on the altar and the altar burns it up. So he says, present decisively, completely, fully, once and for all, present what? Present your bodies. Now, there's two schools of thought here. One say, well, it's just the word body used in the sense of 
yourself. It's just a way of saying, put yourself on the altar. That's what it's trying to say. Everything you are, everything you have, your total personality, your total being, place that on the altar. And I certainly think that there is something in this text of that. But I think there's something more. And it goes back, and unless you have done any study in the background of the New Testament, it's just not going to hit you. But if you know anything about Greek theology, anything about Greek philosophy... Now, I, you know, I've been to Europe several times on mission trips. I have not seen a Greek statue with a, a stitch of clothes on it yet. I mean, they are all... Pigeons are embarrassed to sit on them. It, every statue is naked over there. They don't cover anything up. And you'd think the Greeks just marveled in the human body. And in some senses, they did. They did all their athletic contests in the nude. But on the other side, it, the Greeks would say that the source of evil is the body. They would say that this light from God dwells in every man, but at death the light goes back to God, and that the body is the prison house of the soul. They place the source of evil not in themselves, but in this physical, material body. That's why, by the way, they couldn't let Jesus be fully God incarnated in a human body. But that's exactly what we do. Matter of fact, we say in Christ, we're the only religion in the world that says that we're going to have a physical body in eternity. We're the only religion that says that by God becoming a man said something about the wonder and majesty of human beings. That God would, would become a man, would want to become a man, could become a man, shouts about the unique wonder of us as individual eternal beings. And I think we are an eternal being once we come into existence. We're going to spend somewhere in eternity. And so it's our bodies we are to get. Why? It's not by action. This same word present, now I'm using parallel passages now, watch the margin of your Bible, is used back in chapter 6, beginning in like chapter 6, 13, chapter 6, 19. And what it's talking about is that in 6 it says you, that Jesus Christ has pulled the sin nature out of us and that we need to die to sin to live to God. Now think what I'm saying. Most folks think, that if I become a Christian, then I'm free to do what I want to. Not so. We are free not to serve sin and self and Satan. We're free now to serve God. That's what we're free to. We're not free to do what we want to do. We're free now to do what God wants us to do. This overemphasis on American individuality, we've got to fight all the time. I'm saved, now I can make choices. You don't want to make choices. You Look at the choices you made in the past. What did they work out for you? Death. No, we're not free. But we're free from sin now so that we can serve God with our bodies. That's the whole point. God wants not a dead animal placed on a sacrifice to be burned up. God wants a living sacrifice that will burn for him for 40, 50, 60 years. Present decisive dedication of yourselves, your bodies, a living and holy. This word holy means to set apart for God's use. It doesn't mean you have a halo. It doesn't mean you glow in the dark. You've just eaten radioactive peanut butter or something. It has nothing to do with spirituality. We don't need an aurora. What we need is a godly lifestyle, a holy Sacrifice. Now, what, that's strange stuff. I, I never heard of a living sacrifice. It's exactly the difference between the Old Testament and the New. I'll develop that in just a minute. This sacrifice is acceptable to God. It's well-pleasing to Him. This is something He affirms. This is something He wants. My goodness. God wants me to give myself to Him as a servant. That's exactly what God wants. What did you think God wanted from you? To say some nice words to Him when you pray? To come sit in the building a couple of times a week? To put Jesus loves you on your bumper? What, what, do you, what did you think He wanted from you when He saved you? Well, He just didn't want to have His hotel empty. Oh, that's great. 
No, he wants you to serve him. There's something lacking in us if we don't serve him. We're going to serve something. In our society, we're serving things and self. And, no, we, we've got to serve something. Now, let's just say acceptable to God, which is your... Now, what's your translation? Mine's a little different here. My New American Standard says, which is your spiritual service of worship. Uh, my Williams translation says, which is your reasonable service. This is a form of the word logos, which we get the word, the word was with God, and the word, logos, was God. Same thing in 1 John chapter, in the beginning was the logos, the word. It's a, a title for Jesus that goes back to the Old Testament. It goes back, and goes back into Greek society. Greek society thought the logos was a kind of a semi-personal controller of the universe. And so some say, well, it means reasonable or rational. And it's used that way many times in the Bible as something that's rational or reasonable or to be expected by intelligent animals, rational animals, that kind of thing, human beings. But in 1 Peter, and I believe it's 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 22, something like that. Maybe it's 2, 2. It's used for that new Christians need the Spiritual milk of the word. It's used in the sense of spiritual. I think it means to, to give to God the essence of what we are. To bring to God every... It's almost like a parallel to present your bodies. And what it means is we come to Him with all of our thoughts and dreams and plans and we give those to Him and that's to be expected. I mean, that's the normal. That's not the unusual. My big problem with us today is that we think someone who is spiritual is someone who's abnormal. The problem with sin is abnormal for the Christian. That's what's abnormal. It's not, it's not abnormal to be filled with the Spirit. That's normal and for everybody. But we've taken the abnormal as the normal because we're so unused to the normal. Spiritual service of worship. And now he comes down to, to kind of clarify this whole thing again. And do not be conformed. Now, this is a very special construction. It means stop an act already in process. I like the Phillips translation here where it says, don't let the world fit you into its mold. Now, that's the idea. Because the word conform here is a play on two words in Greek. The same Greek play is seen, by the way, in this wonderful hymn about Christ in Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 through 8, that Jesus came as a servant, right? He came in the appearance as a man. Well, that word appearance as a man is the same word conformity here. What it usually means is the outward expression of something that is always changing. A little seed becomes a, a, a little plant, becomes a bush. A, a, a baby becomes a, a child, becomes a, a, a young person, becomes an adult, becomes a person. That everything in this world is in flux. Everything is changing. Nothing is the same. That's this word conformity. And it's used of our world, our culture. Just think with me, those of you who are older, how different things are today. I'll, I'll take one example. You know what? Uh, young people love to wear hats today, all kinds of hats, especially ball hats and stuff like that, and they wear them everywhere. But uh, I see people, we have a rule, you can't wear a hat in chapel because obviously God cannot be worshipped with a hat, right? Well, people in the generation past, when you walked inside anywhere, your elders would knock the hat off your head, would they not? And they would really say, that's just rude. That's really, now, they didn't ever tell you why it was rude, but it was just rude. Wearing a hat inside is rude. Young people don't feel that way. It's not rude to them. They haven't been told that. Look, 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 look how much everything in our attitudes about things like that have changed. We, we change what we drink. Oh, I like Coke. Oh, I like Pepsi. Oh, I like lemonade. Who cares? It just, those kind of fads go and come. The clothes we wear. Think of what you wore back in the 50s and then tell your kid he looks funny. <laughs> Did you know my teenage daughter wore my insulated quilted underwear to junior high school? <laughs> oh, 
Well, I guess she was warm, but I don't know. But, uh, the world is changing. The thoughts of the world change. The desires of the world change. The Christian should not be conformed just to the changing pattern of a fallen world system. And all too often, Christians don't know the difference because they don't know their book into what is changing and what is eternal. They only know what they grew up with, and suddenly what they grew up with becomes God's will for every person in every age. And isn't that a... Yes, it is. Don't be pushed in the mold of the world. Don't let this outer changing form... And really it's not don't, it's stop. These early Christians were being formed into their pattern of their culture. They were being... They were, their eyes were cultural eyes. The pattern of their life was a cultural life. It wasn't godly, it was cultural. So he says, stop being conformed to the, the outward changing form. Now the word here really in Greek is not the world, it's the word age. You see, in the Bible there's really only two ages. There's this evil age in which we live. Matter of fact, 2 Corinthians 4, 4 says, The God of this age has blinded the minds of the unbelieving. There's this period right now where men are in rebellion against God and Satan is active in, in blinding the eyes of people. But there's coming a new age. The age of the Messiah. The age of righteousness. It's coming. Those of us in the church, the only, the only question about those two ages is that ever since Jesus came in Bethlehem, those ages have been overlapped. So Jesus can say the kingdom of God is near you, it's in your mouth. And he can turn right around and say the kingdom of God is coming. So the truth is the new age is here in Jesus and the new age is not fully consummated yet. But our problem is we don't have our eyes on Jesus in the new age. I'm not talking about the new age as far as the philosophy today. But we, we have our eyes on the changing pattern of the world and wonder where the joy and happiness and, and effective service is in our lives. Stop being conformed to this world, but be transformed. Here's the other word. This is exactly the same word used in Matthew 17, 2, when Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration began to glow in front of the inner circle of the apostles. The inner, the unchanging essence of Jesus, which I believe is God, broke through the changing form of humanity and they saw Jesus glorified there. Now this unchangingness, this, this essence of something is what he's saying to us here. Don't be conformed to this world, but be changed, be transformed, be renewed, however you want to put it. Be, be, be new age people in the sense of God's new age. Have this new mind in you that was also in Christ Jesus. That's what we're talking about. It's a brand new set of glasses to look at the world. It's no longer me. And how much? And what do I get out of it? It becomes the, the glasses of a servant. What can I do? How can I help you in God's name? How can I serve you? It's a whole different worldview, whole different change, totally different focus on life. So it says, be transformed, be changed. Now, I want to show you something here, and I, I want to ask you about, look and see what translation you have right now if you don't know, would you? My New American Standard says, this is the way it flows, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Okay? Now, here's the Williams translation. Listen to this one. Stop living in accordance with the customs of this world, but by the new ideas that mold your minds, continue to transform yourselves. Now, what have I just done? I've changed this word transform. One of them says that it's passive. And passive means that the person you're talking about does not do the action. That is an outside agent. What it means is, God, conform me. God, change me. God, do something in me to help me live right. But William's translation does not make it passive. It makes it middle, which says that I must participate uniquely in the action that's taking place. That I need to transform myself. You say, now, Bob, you know you can't transform yourself. That's exactly true. But the problem is, some of us never even try. 
never even start, never even are willing to participate. Now, I want to show you the same biblical paradox in the Old Testament. It won't take long. Ezekiel chapter 18. I want you to turn there with me. Ezekiel 18. And I want to look at verse 31. And then while you're looking there, Ezekiel 36. Go keep your finger in 18 and 36. I want to show you the same kind of a dual way of saying something. Ezekiel 18.31 says this, Cast away from you all your transgressions which you have committed and make yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. Make yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. Why will you die, O house of Israel? Now look at 36, 26 and 27. Same book, same prophet, 36, 26 and 27. Is in a, in a series of what God is going to do for Israel, even though Israel doesn't deserve it. That's what verse 22 says. Here's 26. Therefore, I will give you a new heart, and I will put a new spirit within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will be careful to observe my ordinances. Now, you say, well... What does that have to do back over here in the book of Romans? Well, it has to do this. I want to say with all my heart and soul, if my Christian life depends on me, I am a failure before I begin. I have no hope of doing what God wants me to do. I want to tell you, the older I get and the more I know the Bible, the more I don't trust me. And a prayer that I pray over and over and over again, God deliver me from the evil of my own heart. Only I know the monster that lives inside this preacher. And that monster is contained not by Bob, but by the undeserved, unmerited grace of God. Any day, any of us could play the fool so badly. But I tell you what, though I know I can't, I also know that the way God has structured his world is that he lets me participate in everything he's doing for me. I had to receive Jesus Christ. I couldn't do anything for it, but I had to say, yes, Jesus, come into my life. I've got to do the very same thing for the Christian life. The Christian life is a supernatural life beyond the ability of any sinful human being to do, but God wants me to voluntarily cooperate with him in living for him. You say, what does that mean? What? Well, it just gets real practical. Uh, if you have a problem with gambling, don't go pet the horses. If you have a problem with lust, don't be looking at pictures to show how strong you are. You hear what I'm saying to you? We, our view in the Christian life, and watch this, our view is, Bob, young people ask me this all the time. Watch this, would you please? How close can I get to the line, Bob, without really sinning? How close? Is that all right? Do I look normal to you? you know. We want to know how much we can get away with. How close can I get and not sin? And I want to tell you what God will do. He'll take the line and put it right inside your heart and there's no more question of how close you can get to anymore. We're looking for theological reasons to sin and God's looking for the want to that make us what he wants us to be. Stop being conformed. Transform. And I really like transform yourself. Both these things in Greek look just alike. Same form for passive and middle. And so here's two translations. You have to decide what you think fits the context best. By the renewing of your mind. Now I want to stop just for a minute talking about this renewing. For the Hebrews, and of course Paul's a Hebrew. He writes Greek. He lives in the Greek world. He mentions the Gentile, but the guy's a Jew. To the Hebrew, the eyes and ears were the windows of the soul. And what we choose to let in, our minds, will suddenly become what we are. Oh, that's scary. You mean this thing that God has given me is a computer that has no erasure mode? You got it. You let it in, it gets stored. It may go subconscious, it may go subliminal, but it's still there. Don't you see the problem now of, of what sin does to us? Don't you see the problem now with things that we let our minds dwell on? Matter of fact, Proverbs 23, 7 says, As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. What you think about is what you'll become. 
So when the Bible, the old King James says, gird up the loins of your mind, what was it saying to you? Protect yourself. Close some of those windows to the world. Choose. No, that's not for me. That's not for my Christ. That's embarrassing to the world of God. But all, well, boy, we're exploring. We're out there trying it. I, got, I can't condemn it if I don't try it. Well, think about the cancer in that sense. Do you got to jump off a cliff to know it's kind of dumb? Do you drink poison to see how it tastes? Now, don't be dumb. So why do we have all this corrupting stuff in us and then wonder why we can't get free from it? Our bodies become addicted to things. What we need to be addicted to is the things of God, the things of prayer, the things of Bible reading, the things of witnessing, the things of giving. If we're going to get into a habit, let's get into God's habit of praising instead of in the world's habit of sinning. Just think of the groups we have today. So-and-so anonymous, so-and-so anonymous, so-and-so anonymous. They're anonymous because they're trapped in sin. Now, I agree with them that there is a time where we, once we're addicted, only God can get us out of it. But we do have a choice up front at every one of those. If we don't protect our mind, you think, you think TV will? You think Playboy will? You think the, the sugar boat over there will? What do you want to be and do? You say, but I want to have fun and kicks and experience everything. You're in for a long, hard, difficult life. And it may be, I tell you, sin is exciting for a season, but that sucker will devastate you at the end. It's children come home and stay. No, gird up your mind. Protect yourself. By the renewing of your mind, that you may prove. This word is used of metal. It means to put metal in something, to heat it up, and to, and to kind of test it, get, get it pure, get the dross off. This is a word that means that, that what we do by renewing our mind, we may prove what the will of God is, that we may test it and find it sure. Now, the first will of God, this is not the will of God. The will of God is that we believe on him who he has sent. There's the will of God. But once we know Jesus, there become several wills of God. One of them is in Ephesians 5 called, Be filled with the Spirit, a will of God. This is another will of God. And what is this will of God? Well, this will of God is saying, look what it says. The will of God is that which is good, that which is acceptable, same word used for a sacrifice up there, and that which is mature. The word is perfect. The word... The word means to be equipped for an assigned task. It was used of chickens that got big enough to go to market. It was used of a broken leg that had mended back and now it could be walked on. It was used of a ship that thought it was finished in wood. The ropes and the sails weren't put on. But when the ropes and sails, the ship was said to be perfect, mature, equipped for the assigned task. Now what God wants to do, he knows we're going to sin. There's no doubt about that. But he's trying to equip us for the assigned task. And the assigned task is being the Christ-like people of God 24 hours a day, seven days a week in every circumstance of life. That's what the will of God is. That's what it is. Oh, my. Jesus, I'm not sure I can do this. I guarantee you you can't do it, Bob. All you can do is be available to be placed on the altar. Would you close your eyes with me, please? I want you to think of your life right now, all the things that are important to you, and I want you to visualize them as being right in your hands, right in your hands, all the things you desire and think and dream for and cling to. And, and I want you to picture yourself getting up on top of an altar and laying your full body out before the Lord with all the things you dream and desire. You are not your own. You've been bought with a price. Glorify God in your body. Christianity is not a creed. It is not a building. It is not a couple of days a week. It is not a religious ritual. It is a walk with God through Christ when God becomes boss. 
And right now, what's he asking you to lay down for him? Paul would say, is there anything pure? Is there anything holy? Is there anything of good repute? Think on these things. What are we thinking about? What is our mind dwelling on? What does our heart long for? Lay it on the altar, my friend. Lay it on the altar and light the fire. Don't be conformed to the image of this world, but be transformed. Transform yourself by the renewing of your mind. Get a new worldview. Get a new priority. Get a new integrating center. It will be worth it all when we see Him. You'll be so happy you did that when you see Him. Would you look at me for a minute? My great fear is at the end of my life, sitting on a rocking chair on some porch and looking back, I'll be so sorry I didn't live for God. Now's the time. Not tomorrow. Today. You've got to give it to God today. And I'm not sure I know what it is. But anything that's not spelled G-O-D... Or Jesus is it. You've got to give it to him. You say, this is radical stuff. I want to tell you the New Testament is radical stuff. That's why it doesn't fit well with contemporary society. Lord, you know what you want to do. I pray you do it in Jesus' name. Amen.